Welcome to tonight's virtual book tour with Dr. Andrew Butson. This program is co-sponsored by the Berkshire Area Health Education Center in Dalton, Massachusetts, and the Oshner Lifelong Learning Institute at Berkshire Community College in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Dr. Butson is Chief of Cognitive and Behavioral Neurology, Associate Chief of Staff for Education, and Director of the Center for Translational Cognitive Neuroscience at the Veterans Affairs Boston Healthcare System. He is Associate Director and Leader of the Outreach, Recruitment, and Engagement Corps of the Boston University Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, Professor of Neurology at Boston University School of Medicine, Lecturer in Neurology at Harvard Medical School, and the Medical Director of the Boston Center for Memory. Dr. Budson has given over 650 local, national, and international academic talks his books have been or are being translated into Spanish, Portuguese, Japanese, Korean, and Chinese. His current research uses the techniques of experimental psychology and cognitive neuroscience to understand memory in patients with Alzheimer's disease. Please join me in welcoming tonight's speaker, Dr. Andrew Butson. Well, thanks so much, uh, Carol. It's my uh, pleasure to speak with you all this uh, evening. And we are going to have some, some fun here, I think, and also learn uh, quite a bit. And uh, let me go ahead and start uh, sharing my screen. We're gonna both share some slides and I'll also be just talking to you for a little bit. So here's my title slide. You heard uh, my titles already. And we're going to talk about both of these books, although we're going to spend the most time on the seven steps to managing your memory, because I think this is the content that is um, in, uh, most relevant to uh, you all. And we're going to talk about all these different, uh, different steps here, the seven steps to managing your memory, but we're going to begin by learning what you already know. And to do this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read some common memory scenarios that uh, we've actually written into the preface uh, of our, our book. And as I read each of these scenarios, I want you to use the chat function to either say, yes, that is normal, just what happens to people and their memory as they get a little older, or I want you to say no if you say, wait a minute, that doesn't sound normal. That sounds like it could be the start of Alzheimer's disease or dementia. And in fact, you don't have to type in a full um, yes and no. You can just type Y or N. So if it's the answer is yes, type a Y. If the answer is a no, uh, type an N. Okay, so I hope that makes sense to everyone. So here is the first scenario. So again, if you think this scenario was normal, type in Y. If you think it's abnormal, type in N. Here's the first scenario. So you walk into a room to get something and you forget why you're there. What do you think? Is that normal? That's right. I wanna see a big letter Y from everyone. That one is normal. Ooh, thank God, right? If that one wasn't normal, we would all be in trouble. All right, how about this one here? You're having trouble remembering some of the details of your life, such as your wedding. What do you think? Is that normal or not normal? Hmm, we have a split decision. Some people say why, some people say N. All right, how about this one? When you are driving and not paying attention, you take one or more wrong turns and you end up somewhere you did not intend to be. What do you think? Normal, not normal? Hmm. Oh, I think we have another split decision there, huh? Maybe another split decision. How about this one? You have difficulty finding your car in a parking lot. Is that normal? What do you think? I think most people are like, I hope that one's normal, right? 
And now what about my all time favorite? Your family tells you that you've asked that question before. What do you think? Is that normal or not normal? All right, so it is my job this evening to empower you all with the knowledge so that you can know whether these and other common memory issues that may come up with either yourself or with a loved one, whether these things are normal, whether they're not, and most importantly, what to do about them. And to do this, we are going to dive in now to the seven steps to managing your memory. And we're gonna begin with step one, which is learn what is normal memory. And we're gonna begin with a filing system analogy as to how your memory works. So let's say you have something that you want to remember, like somebody's name. Well, in order to get that into your memory, the first part of our memory system we need is your file clerk. Your file clerk is actually a part of your brain. It's your frontal lobes right behind your forehead. And it's the frontal lobe file clerk's job to take information in from the outside world and to put it into the file cabinet. Now, when we want to retrieve a memory, the frontal lobe file clerk walks over to the file cabinet, looks through the different memories and retrieves the one that we're looking for. So that's good, but guess what? As we all get older, our frontal lobe file clerk is getting older too. And I'm going to continue with using an analogy to let you know three of the common changes that occur in normal aging. So one thing that happens to our older frontal lobe file clerk is they do not hear quite as well as they used to. What? And because of that, in normal aging, information may need to be repeated a couple of times in order for the frontal lobe file clerk to get a hold of it and to put it into the file cabinet. Now, another thing that happens to our older frontal lobe file clerk is they do not move quite as quickly as they used to. So you can imagine that it takes a little bit of time for our frontal lobe file clerk to walk over to the file cabinet and retrieve the memory that they are looking for. Now, the third thing that can happen to our older frontal lobe file clerk as part of normal aging is they do not see quite as well as they used to. So you can imagine our older file clerk looking up and down the file cabinet, trying to find the memory that they're looking for. They may need a hint or a cue to find the information that they're looking for. But importantly, in normal aging, as long as the information got into the file cabinet, it should be able to be retrieved, even if it takes a little bit of time or a hint or a cue. So in a nutshell, those are the changes that we expect to see as part of normal aging. Now, we are going to move on to step two, determine if your memory is normal. And here we're going to explore some of the changes that occur to memory in Alzheimer's disease. And we are going to focus on the file cabinet. Now, the file cabinet is another part of your brain. It's called your hippocampus, and it's deep in your temporal lobes. So if you put your fingers on your temples, it's just deep in there. And the problem in Alzheimer's 
is Alzheimer's damages and ultimately ends up destroying the hippocampus. And the way I think about it is imagine if you pulled open that file drawer and you look down inside, you would see a big hole in the bottom of the file cabinet. Well, if there's a hole in the bottom of the file cabinet, you could have the best, most efficient file clerk in the world, pulling in information from the outside environment, putting it into the file cabinet. But what's gonna happen? It's gonna disappear down the hole, never to be retrieved again. And when that happens, even when information is repeated, even if you wait a bit of time or give a hint or a cue, it cannot be retrieved. And when that happens, we call it rapid forgetting because the information is rapidly lost. And rapid forgetting is never normal. It should always be evaluated. Well, let's talk about some of the other problems that can occur in Alzheimer's disease. And one of them is getting lost. Now, anybody of any age can get lost. You make a wrong turn, something doesn't look familiar, bam, you're lost. But what do we all normally do? Well, you can pull out a map from your glove compartment if you're old school. Uh, this day and age, probably more likely you pull out the map from your phone. You can use your GPS device, or you can pull over and ask for directions. And using any of those methods, you're back on your way. But in Alzheimer's disease, paper maps and phone apps and GPS devices can be complicated and confusing to use. You can pull over and ask for directions, but they're often long and detailed and hard to remember. And it's for those reasons that people with Alzheimer's have such difficulty getting lost. Let's talk about another thing that can happen in Alzheimer's disease, which is losing things, misplacing things. But you know what? Misplacing things is also pretty common. I want you to type a Y into the chat. If in the last year, you have misplaced your keys, glasses, wallet, cell phone, pocketbook, has that happened to anybody? Yeah, me too. So if you lose things, if you misplace things, how do you know if it's normal or not? Well, look, if you're someone who Every morning, all your life, you know, you spend five, 10, you know, 15 minutes, you know, hunting around the house, you know, trying to figure out, you know, where you put things. And now you're getting a little bit older and you're still spending five, 10, 15 minutes hunting around the house looking for things. Well, guess what? That's probably normal for you and not something to worry about. But if you were somebody who was always very organized, never had to hunt around looking for things, and now it's taking you not only 5, 10, 15 minutes, but maybe 20 minutes or an hour hunting around the house looking for things, maybe you had to buy a new cell phone because it never did turn up, maybe you had to cancel the credit cards because you never could find that wallet, well, that could be a problem. So the point I'm trying to make here is it's not only what the problem is, but also whether it represents a change from the way things used to be. Now, the last thing I wanna mention in this section is about repeating questions and stories. Now, anybody can be halfway through telling a story to a close friend and you say, oh my God, I told you this already, didn't I? and anybody can forget the answer to a question and ask it again. But when there is a pattern of repeatedly asking the same question to the same person again and again and again, or telling the same story to the same people over and over and over again, that is not normal. 
that's usually due to that rapid forgetting that we were talking about because people rapidly forget that they asked that question or they told that story. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> um, somebody in the chat says, but Alzheimer's patients misplace things in abnormal places like the refrigerator. That can happen really late in the disease, okay? Absolutely that can happen. But early on, <clears throat> it can be just not being able to find anything, a change from the past. The important thing on this point is it's a change. Okay, let's continue with our seven steps. And now we're going to go to step three, understand your memory loss. And I'm going to begin by answering the question that I get asked more than any other, which is what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? And so dementia simply means there is a decline in thinking and memory that is severe enough that it interferes with day-to-day -day function. So dementia is a general category. And I think about the word dementia, like I think about another general category, like a headache, okay? A headache can be caused by a lot of different things. You can have a muscle tension headache or a migraine headache, neither of which are very serious. But you can also have a headache from a stroke or a brain tumor, both of which obviously are serious. And with dementia, it's the same way. You can have dementia from something as simple and as treatable as a vitamin deficiency or a thyroid disorder but you can also have dementia from a variety of different brain diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, which is similar to Parkinson's disease dementia, vascular dementia, which is dementia due to strokes, and there's many other types as well. So dementia is the general category and Alzheimer's is one type or one cause of dementia. Everybody got it? Let's talk about another term that gets used a lot, which is mild cognitive impairment. So mild cognitive impairment is used when three things are present. The first is someone is concerned about the memory. It can be the individual themselves, it can be their family, or it can be their doctor. The second is that when the individual undergoes pencil and paper testing, yes, indeed, a problem is found. So the concern is confirmed by the pencil and paper testing. The third thing, however, is their day-to-day -day function is fine. Well, if their day-to-day -day function is fine, then by definition, they do not have dementia. Now, if you follow people over time with mild cognitive impairment, what you find is that about half of them do end up declining and developing either Alzheimer's disease or another cause of dementia. But that also means the other half don't. The other half either stay stable over time or their memory actually improves over time. You might say, how does anybody's memory improve over time? Well, if their memory is due to depression, low mood, which is a very common cause of memory problems. If their mood lifts, their memory can get better. Another common cause of memory problems are medication side effects. And if the individual works with their doctor, and their medications get adjusted, their memory can improve. Okay, we're gonna move on now to step four, which is treat your memory loss. And we're gonna talk about both the FDA approved medications and also some of the medications that are uh, in research studies uh, right now. But before I talk with you about the medications, I need to tell you a little bit more about Alzheimer's disease so you will 
understand how the medicines work. So Alzheimer's disease starts with an accumulation of a protein called beta amyloid. The amyloid clusters and clumps together to form plaques, which is what these big blue arrows are uh, pointing to. The plaques get bigger and bigger and bigger, and they start to damage neighboring brain cells. And then inside the cell, another protein called tau gets loose, and the tau is very sticky, and it sticks to itself, and it forms these long chains, and the chains get all tangled up. So these are the plaques and the tangles that you might have heard about in Alzheimer's disease. Now, once the tangles form inside the cells, it kills the cells. And the cells are normally making chemicals, neurotransmitters that allow different parts of the brain to talk to one another. And one of the most important chemicals is called acetylcholine. So in Alzheimer's disease, levels of acetylcholine drop. Now, it's for this reason that the mainstay of therapy are medications that can help to raise up the levels of acetylcholine. Now, from the perspective of the individual and their families, what these medications can do is they can turn the clock back on memory loss by six to 12 months. And these are medications that I bet many of you have heard of. So these include Dinepazil, whose brand name is Aricept, Rivastigmine, whose brand name is Exelon, and Galantamine. All of these medications help to turn the clock back by six to 12 months. And the earlier that someone comes to see me in the clinic, the more likely it is that I can turn that clock back by a full year. And the reason why is <clears throat> there are likely to be more brain cells that are still living the earlier they come to see me. Now, <clears throat> although I can make somebody's memory like it was six months ago, or maybe even a full year ago, I cannot stop the clock from ticking down. So what that means is if I see that same individual back in say two, three, four years later, yes, it's true, their memory is going to be worse off than when I first met them. But that does not mean that the medication is not still working. As long as they had a good initial response, it almost certainly is still working. And if the individual stops the medicine, what happens is they plummet six to 12 months worth of memory function in one to two weeks. So again, as long as they had a good response, I really want people to stay on it pretty much forever. Now, there, you know, one thing that, you know, would be great is if we could slow down that ticking clock, right? That would really be good. And there are medicines that are being developed in clinical trials that are trying to do just that. So <clears throat> these are medications that work to try to remove the plaques and the tangles from the brain to actually slow down the disease process. And this is what aducanumab or aduhelm uh, is trying to do. And you might have heard about this in the news the last couple of months. Uh, so I thought I'd spend a minute and tell you about aducanumab and my take on it, because it's very unclear. So you may have seen or read in the paper this announcement that in June, June 7th of this year, the FDA granted what they call accelerated approval for this drug, aducanumab or aduhelm. So aducanumab is a monoclonal antibody. Now, an antibody is what your body normally makes itself to fight against infections, meaning like bacteria and viruses. So when uh, 
you all got the uh, COVID vaccine, that vaccine allowed your body to make antibodies against the COVID virus. So in this case, there's an antibody that's made in a laboratory against the amyloid plaques, okay? And the idea is once the antibody sticks to the amyloid plaque, it's tagged as something bad, right? Like a virus or a bacteria. And the rest of the immune system comes in and removes whatever the antibody's on. And in this case, it means the immune system removes the plaques from the brain. So let's talk about what happened here. So the company, Biogen, had two large, uh, nearly identical 18-month studies, so long time, okay, 18 months. They had 1,000 patients in each study. And in March of 2019, they looked at the pooled data together from both of those studies, and they said, you know what? This drug doesn't work. And they said, all right, we're throwing in the towel. We're canceling both studies. Then in October of 2019, they said, wait a minute, wait a minute. It looks like one of the studies worked. It was just the other one that didn't work. And they filed for FDA approval. So I uh, had the uh, pleasure of watching the seven hour FDA advisory panel review the data. And it was open to the public. And because it was during the pandemic, it was on Zoom uh, or a similar platform. And all the data is publicly available as well. It's available right now today on the FDA website. So I looked at all the data and I took this slide uh, from the FDA, uh, the published FDA data. And it's a little bit of a complicated slide, but it's worth going through so you understand the data yourself. So what we are looking at here is as things go closer to the left, more amyloid is being removed from the brain. Then the lower, when there is uh, bubbles that are below this red baseline, it means that the treatment is causing a clinical effect, an effect that patients and more importantly, families can see, okay? because people are always not good judges of themselves, but uh, it, it shows how families uh, feel the individual is doing. If they're above this red line, it means that it's actually not working and families are not seeing that there is an effect. And the first thing I wanna point out is that the two low dose doubles. So we're, we're just focusing on the blue and the green studies. These are the big, large studies. Um, the pink studies are very small. Um, so you can see the blue and the green studies at the low dose, nothing really happened, right? They're basically sitting uh, pretty much right on top of this line. So no particular effect. But the high dose of the green study is now below, going below this red line. So hooray, looks like the drug worked. But look at the high dose of the blue study. It's above the red line, meaning that not only doesn't it work, it means the drug made things worse. Uh-oh, looks like it doesn't work. And in fact, the amount that it, it made people worse is almost exactly the same amount that the other study made things better. So they're almost like mirror images. One made things uh, worse by a little bit more than 0.5. The other made things better by a little bit more than 0.5, okay? So it's about the same. So the positive trial showed that you could actually turn the clock back by an equivalent of three months out of 18 months. But the negative trial, it was that the clock was turned forward by three months out of the uh, 18 month trial. And the thing is, you might say, well, maybe we should still give it a try, but there are side effects. So 
30% of people got brain swelling. Can, I don't know if you can appreciate if you're not used to looking at brain scans, but this sort of white stuff and how smooth this looks, all this white areas, these are abnormalities, okay? And this is from an actual patient in the study showing swelling in their brain that 30% of people had, and 10% of people had brain hemorrhages. So let's just think about this for a minute. So on the one hand, it's not clear whether it works or not, right? You don't know. One study was positive, one study was negative. But what you do know is that 40% of people end up with either brain swelling or brain bleeds. And based upon these data, the FDA advisory panel said, we don't think this should be approved. Out of the, I think it was 11 members of the panel, two abstained, the other nine said no, should not be approved. But what did the FDA do? They approved it anyways. And people still don't understand why. So <clears throat> it's indicated for the MCI in mild dementia stages. We don't really know if it works. You need to have either an amyloid PET scan or a lumbar puncture to make sure you really have Alzheimer's before you would take it. You need a monthly infusion forever. It costs $56,000 a year. It's currently not paid for by any, um, by any insurance companies. And then of course you need the MRI scans routinely to look for this brain swelling and braid uh, bleeding. So as you can see, I don't recommend this drug. And I would recommend that people who want to try to slow down that ticking clock, you know, look into a clinical trial of a medication that might be more promising. All right. So there's other medications that don't work as well. Uh, Prevagen, they advertise on TV all the time. No evidence it works. And in fact, the state of New York and the Federal Trade Commission teamed together to sue the makers of Prevagen for false advertising, but it doesn't seem to stop them. Curcumin is uh, one of the substances in curry. And uh, I'm a big curry fan. I love curries. And I, I was really looking forward to these data being very positive. I, I think the jury is still out. We're just not sure. I don't think it'll hurt you to eat curries. If you like curries, eat curries. Uh, but I don't think there's good evidence it works. Ginkgo biloba, resveratrol, none of these things do I believe there's good evidence that they work. All right, so let's move on now to step five, which is modify your lifestyle. And we are going to talk about foods and exercise. <clears throat> so what are the foods that help? Well, <clears throat> fish, olive oil, <clears throat> avocados, fruits and vegetables, nuts and beans, and whole grains. These are all part of the Mediterranean menu of foods. And there's a similar uh, diet called the MIND diet that also showed that poultry, like chicken and turkey, <clears throat> is also healthy. So you don't need to feel guilty about eating turkey uh, last week. So <clears throat> those are the things that are good to eat. Now you might be wondering, okay, so what are the things that are not good to eat? Well, I hate to tell you, it's almost everything else. So red meats, fried foods, fast foods, butter and margarine, pastries and most sweets, white bread, white flour, white rice, sugar sodas, sugar juices, diet sodas, diet juices, all of these I would put in the category of once in a while foods not every single day foods. All right, now before everybody gets really depressed and thinks, oh my God, I can never have dessert again. I did want to remind you that chocolate in small amounts has been shown to benefit thinking and memory and mood. You just have to remember that it's what type of chocolate? That's right, dark chocolate, the darker, the better because it's the cacao that's actually good for you and not so much the sugar and the butter and the milk they put into it to make it sweet and creamy. All right, 
So now we're going to talk about exercise. And if I inspire you tonight, before you lace up your jogging shoes and go running out the door, regardless of what time of day or night it is, I did want to remind you to please check with your doctor and just make sure that your heart and your lungs and your bones and your joints are ready for whatever increase in exercise you're going to do. But having said that, there's exercise that like everybody can do. And many of the studies that I'm going to be talking about uh, right now used brisk walking as their exercise of choice. But there's so many other types of aerobic exercise that you can do. So speaking of aerobic, what is aerobic anyways? Aerobic is exercise that gets your heart beating quickly, gets you breathing heavy. That's how you know it's aerobic. And the recommended amount is at least, note that I'm saying at least five days a week, 30 minutes a day of aerobic exercise. Now also recommended are two hours a week of exercise to help with strength and balance and flexibility. And these are exercises like yoga, Tai Chi, Pilates, and isometric weightlifting. Well, there's so many benefits to exercise. I'm sure you all know that exercise reduces your risk of heart disease and strokes, but it's worth saying because strokes are a major cause of memory problems. Exercise also reduces your risk of falls. And when people fall and hit their head, that's another way to have memory problems. Did you know that exercise is actually a natural antidepressant? And we talked about how depression is a cause of memory problems. Well, exercise is actually as good or better than many antidepressants that are currently prescribed today. Did you know exercise improves your sleep? You might say, well, that's good, but what does sleep have to do with memory? Turns out that sleep has a lot to do with memory. I'm gonna tell you three of the reasons. The first is what I call sort of the obvious reason, which is if you don't get good sleep, you're gonna be tired the next day. If you're tired the next day, it's hard to pay attention. And if you can't pay attention, you won't be able to remember things. Second reason, is that we all make a little bit of this beta amyloid protein during the day. But normally we flush it away at night while we are sleeping. The third reason is that sleep enables us to keep our memories for a lifetime. So remember, we talked about our filing system analogy and how all of our new memories are formed and initially stored in our new memory file cabinet in the hippocampus. Well, it turns out that older memories are stored in another part of the brain called the cortex. And this transfer process from the new memory file cabinet to the old memory file cabinet takes place while we are sleeping. So we need to get a good night's rest or this transfer process cannot take place and we won't be able to hold on to our memories for a lifetime. But the most exciting thing that I want to tell you about exercise and memory is that exercise actually releases growth factors from the brain that allows us to grow new brain cells. And guess where there are more new brain cells grown than anywhere else? That's right, you guessed it in the hippocampus. And this increase in brain cells in the hippocampus is so large and robust that you can actually see the effects, not only in younger adults, but in older adults too, in as little as six months on an MRI scan. So people sometimes ask me, Dr. Budson, isn't there some magic bullet out there I can take to really help me improve my memory? I say, yes, there is. Exercise truly is the magic bullet. Okay, now we're going to move on to step six, which is strengthen your memory. And one thing that I always get asked is, 
What about doing crossword puzzles or playing Sudoku or doing computerized brain training games? Can that help my memory? What the studies show is if you spend time with crossword puzzles and Sudoku and brain training games, you get better at crossword puzzles and Sudoku and brain training games. It simply does not translate to overall memory functions. But there are some things that do. And one of them is participating in social activities. And this is probably because many people theorize this is likely what our brain really evolved to do was to navigate social interactions. Another thing that's been shown is if you want to do something with your mind that's gonna help your brain, it should be something new, something novel, something that stretches you out of your comfort zone. You have to put a little effort into it, okay? Should be new and novel and stretching yourself. Now, the third thing I wanna mention, which sounds like pop psychology, but study after study after study, have shown it's really true, which is it's important to keep a positive mental attitude. And we think it works for all the obvious reasons. People with a positive attitude are more likely to be outgoing and social. People with a positive attitude are more likely to take care of themselves and eat right and exercise. What about those brain training games? Well, I'll say, you know, new ones are being developed every day. More and more scientists are getting into this field, and there might be some stuff in the future that's beneficial, but I just don't think there's good evidence quite yet. But I'm sure it's better than TV. Okay, so the other things that we have written into the book are all sorts of different memory strategies. And I'll just mention a few of them here. So if you want to learn to pay attention better, because you know that the more you pay attention, the better you will remember things. You can actually train yourself to become better at paying attention by training yourself in mindfulness, which is basically uh, working on being able to pay attention to what you want to pay attention. Just repeating information can strengthen your memory. When you make a connection between something that you already know with whatever new information that you're trying to learn, that can help. If you create a visual image of what you're trying to remember, that can help tremendously because pictures are better remembered than words alone. You can use the method of loci which was invented by the Greeks uh, more than 2000 years ago. Um, today, we often call it a memory palace, but it's the same thing. You can invent catchy rhymes to remember information. And we also talk about different ways to use all these strategies to remember new names or retrieve old names that of people you've known for 30 years, but you're having trouble coming up with their name this minute. We also talk about all sorts of different memory aids. So for example, you can have a memory table where you put down all the things that you're always losing. So, so you don't have to hunt around looking for your keys and glasses and wallet and pocketbook and cell phone. Put them all in a certain place so that you'll know where they are, right? That's a simple thing to save, but it really helps. If you don't do that and you're hunting around the house for these items, I recommend you get a memory table, put them all there. Pillboxes are great to remember uh, to take your pills. Calendars and planners and date books are great to remember appointments. The idea is use the right type of memory tool, memory aid to help you remember whatever you're trying to remember. Step seven is tells you what to do if you're having some mild memory problems, how do you still keep doing all the things you enjoy doing in life? How do you keep working? How do you keep driving? How do you keep doing your hobbies? And how do you do all these things safely? And we also talk about how do you know when is it time to retire from that job? How do you know when is it time to hang up the keys 
and let someone else do the driving. So those are the seven steps to managing your memory. And we're gonna spend just a couple of minutes, probably 12 minutes on the six steps to managing Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And so this is a little bit uh, different, right? So this is a book that we wrote for uh, caregivers whose loved ones have either Alzheimer's or another cause of dementia. And I'm going to again read from the preface so you will get a sense as to some of the issues that we cover in this uh, book. And what I'm going to read now are quotations from uh, some of my uh, families. And if some of these uh, quotations uh, resonate with you, uh, I want you to put a Y in the chat to say, yeah, Dr. Budson, I know what you're talking about. Here's the first quote. I always thought I had a lot of patience, but if he asked me what we are doing today, one more time, I think I will scream. He wants to drive, but I don't know if it's safe. I've never fooled around in my life. And now, at age 83, my wife is accusing me of having an affair. It's happening every evening now. She keeps saying that she needs to go home, but we're already home. When I came home from the hairdresser, he asked me who I was. He really didn't recognize me. So maybe that sounds a little bit familiar. I can see, yes, for some of you, no, uh, for some others. So we discuss all these issues and more uh, in this book. And I'm just going to spend a couple minutes uh, going through a little bit about these different types of problems, these six steps uh, to managing Alzheimer's disease and dementia, and why some of these problems come up. Well, step one, is about understanding things like what's dementia, what's Alzheimer's, what are the different types, like we talked about before, but going into even more depth. Step two, we talk about how to manage all sorts of different types of problems and how to manage these problems without medications. And we begin with some general approaches. And I'm gonna teach you all one of the approaches right now, which we call the four R's. So let's say we have one of the scenarios that I read about in the preface. Let's say that um, you know, I'm the caregiver and my wife who has dementia uh, is rattling the front door, trying to get out and saying she wants to go home, right? So what should I do? Should I yell at her and say, honey, you're already home. Stop trying to leave the house. I might feel like yelling at her like that, but that's probably not the right approach. So we wanna try the four R's. So we wanna reassure her that everything's okay. We want to reconsider things from her point of view. So she's perhaps remembering a house from many, many years ago, maybe the house that she grew up in, and that's where she's trying to go. So from her perspective, She's not home, she's trying to get there. The third R is redirect. And we want to redirect her away from the door or whatever it is that's upsetting her and toward something that is both distracting and calming. The fourth R is for all of us caregivers to take a deep breath in and relax. Because if we, are irritated or frustrated or angry or upset, we are going to reflect that emotion back to our loved ones. Okay, so that's a little bit about the four R's. And we have a lot of other general strategies. We have start with small steps. We have the three times principles. We also have for very difficult behaviors, we have the ABCs, okay? So the ABCs start with antecedents or what comes before. 
It involves the B for behaviors, which we always want to quantify, and then the C for consequences, what happened afterwards. Now, we often don't think about consequences as being important for behaviors, right? How can something afterwards affect something that came before? But <clears throat> as an example, suppose we have dad and dad does not want to take a bath. Come on, dad, it's time to take a bath. I don't want to take a bath. Come on, dad, you really got to take a bath. It's been like two weeks. I don't want to take a bath. And maybe dad begins to yell and scream and stamp his feet. And we say, all right, fine. We'll skip the bath today. What did we just do? We just taught dad that the consequence of him yelling and screaming and stamping his feet is that he can get out of anything he doesn't want to do. So the ABCs are very helpful when we look at the consequences in addition to the antecedents and how this affects behaviors. And we always quantify things as much as we can. All right, after general approaches, we talk about specific approaches. And we talk about safety issues, about how because our loved one may not remember to turn off the stove and leave it on, we may need to unplug the stove or take the knobs off, right? Uh, we may, uh, our loved one may wander out of the house as the example I gave before. And if this could happen, we want to make a plan for wandering now. We don't wanna wait, okay, until our loved ones wander. That is not the right time to be thinking of, oh, what should I do? My loved ones wandered out of the house. You wanna make a plan today in case that uh, were to happen. False memories are actually very common. And it's actually a big part of my research is trying to understand why is it that individuals with Alzheimer's disease are as likely to remember things that didn't happen as they are to forget that something has happened. And my advice here, as you can see, is don't fight it, just go with it. Okay, uh, reminding people that they have memory problems is rarely helpful. Now, language is something else that deteriorates in Alzheimer's disease. People have trouble initially finding words, but then they have trouble understanding. And sometimes we think it's just trouble with hearing, but in most cases of dementia, eventually the uh, comprehension of language is impaired. Don't forget that you can communicate by using pictures when language breaks down and that the tone of your voice, your facial expression and your body language you can also communicate and you do whether you mean to or not, you are communicating with those uh, non-linguistic uh, parts of yourself. Vision problems are very common in Alzheimer's. People can have trouble recognizing family members. They may think one family member is another, right? They can think a child is actually a spouse. They also may think that you have been replaced by an imposter. You're not the real George, something like that. That's unfortunately not that uncommon. Of course, we want to check for vision uh, and glasses, make sure they're working okay. And simply increasing the lighting and the contrast between, say, steps and risers on stairs can help a lot. And hallucinations, we talk about how do you reduce their impact? Hallucinations are hard to make go away completely but there's a lot of things we can do to reduce their impact so they don't impair our loved one more than is necessary. Emotional issues are very common. Anxiety and depression can come both because there are a few things as anxiety provoking and depressing as either being worried about Alzheimer's disease, being aware that you're losing your memory, they're terrifying, right? But you can also have depression and anxiety in these types of diseases because of biochemical changes in the brain as well. And we teach you how to tell apart real depression from these other uh, sort of depression lookalike uh, syndromes. Behavior problems is obviously very important. So we talk about how do you manage driving? 
And the short answer is I recommend that if someone is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease or another dementia, a family member ride in the passenger seat of the car, you know, in the death seat, <clears throat> along the routes that the patient normally rides. So the patient's driving, family members in the passenger seat. And as long as the family member feels comfortable, then I feel comfortable with the patient driving. If they're hanging on for dear life saying, no, wait, stop, ah, you know, that's when you say, <clears throat> okay, no more drive. Now, <clears throat> let me just talk about um, if somebody gets lost, if they make a wrong turn when they're driving, I don't really care about that because that's not, <clears throat> that's not really a safety issue in the same way that, you know, following the rules of the road, driving in the proper lanes, you know, driving the proper speeds, using proper judgment, those are important safety issues. Getting lost, yeah, whatever, you got lost, big deal. Okay. Um, we then uh, talk about um, how medical problems, right, as you see, there's a lot of these slides I'm not going through. We talk about medical problems uh, because people can have a pneumonia or urinary tract infection that all of a sudden they look much worse. Well, that could be going on. Talk about guns and power tools, other safety issues. Uh, planning around sundowning is really critical. So sundowning, as you may know, is when individuals with dementia in the late afternoon, early evening and night, they often just don't think and behave as well as they do in the morning or around noontime. And if your loved one is like that and the holiday seasons are coming up and you normally have your holiday celebration at say 6 p.m., but you know your loved one with dementia is terrible at 6 p.m. So my advice to you is plan around the sundowning. So, so what if your tradition is 6 p.m. get together? Do a noon get together instead you know, take advantage of the time when your loved one is at their best. Okay, don't argue with jealousy and paranoia, never helps. Use the four R's like we talked about instead. Soothing and familiar music can be very helpful. Real pets and robot pets and even stuffed animals can provide a lot of comfort. Sleep problems are just so, so common. And you know, I had a patient on Monday or a family member on Monday that said, doctor, you gotta give something to my father. He's up at 4 a.m. every morning, waking everybody up. And so I, you know, I typically say, oh, okay, well, you know, let's talk about his sleep schedule. So, you know, what time does he go to bed? I say, oh, we put him to bed around eight o'clock. And I'm realizing, well, that's the whole answer right there. Right, you put him to bed at 8 p.m. By 4 a.m., he's had eight hours of sleep. He's ready to go. Many sleep problems, believe it or not, are as simple as that. And we talk about all different ways to figure things out like that, to improve sleep habits, to look for medical disorders, and using some melatonin can also be helpful for getting onto a good sleep cycle. Now there's so many different problems with bodily functions. We talk about how to improve walking, reduce falls, uh, reduce incontinence. All these things can be helpful uh, approaches for uh, tremors. There's all sorts of different things. Now asking about medications is uh, step three. And that's of course really uh, important. We begin by talking about all the medications that can cause problems. And one of the things that I'm really pleased is that the publisher let me put in list and list and list of bad medicines, both the generic names and the brand names. So that, you know, if this is relevant to you, you can look through these lists of medications, actually, whether it's for a loved one or yourself and figure out if uh, you or they are on a medicine that can make thinking and memory worse. And um, I'll just mention, because everybody asks about it, Cholesterol lowering medications do not cause memory problems. One alcoholic beverage will not cause any permanent damage to the brain, but 
Don't fool yourself. You know, everyone who drinks alcohol knows even a single drink, your thinking and memory are not quite as sharp as they otherwise would be. It's just a fact. Um, but certainly one drink is not gonna impair your memory. But if you're at a cocktail party and you want to remember everyone's name, you would be uh, uh, better at doing it if you don't have that drink. You have a club soda and lime instead. And don't forget, there's non-alcoholic beers and wine and they're getting pretty tasty. Okay. Uh, anesthesia properly administered does not cause long-term memory problems or dementia in my review of the literature. Now, if you're gonna try a medication to try and help improve thinking and memory, I really, uh, or behavior, I really recommend you look at the behavior, the intervention and the effect, and you try to quantify things. Uh, there's an approach that I uh, recommend First, enhancing cognition with medications like Dinepazil or Aricept. Help people feel calmer. And usually that means beginning with one of these so-called SSRIs, the serotonin uh, reuptake inhibitor uh, medications like sertraline or Zoloft. Uh, and we have some other approaches as well. And then as the third line approach, after I've tried these other approaches, we may need to try a, a stronger medicine, something like risperidone or risperdal to help suppress uh, behaviors. Okay, step four is build your care team. And we always start with the most important member of the care team, which is you, if you are the primary caregiver. And my co-author, Dr. Maureen O'Connor, she wrote this section and she has this wonderful uh, uh, phrase here which is you can't pour from an empty cup. So the idea is you have to care for yourself, okay, in order to be the best caregiver that you can be. We also talk about how do you build your care team? How do you get friends and families and neighbors to help with different tasks and how support groups and professional caregivers, respite care, day programs can all be helpful. Don't forget the Alzheimer's Association is a good resource as well as your doctor. Step five is sustain your relationship. And here we talk about the ways that you can keep your relationship going even though there's uh, changes in the ability of your loved one. You always wanna start small, uh, so you don't be disappointed. And we often need to go with the flow because things don't always work out exactly as planned. But there are so many different ways uh, uh, that we can uh, enjoy spending time with our loved one and sustain our uh, relationship. And don't forget the last bullet here, consider participating in research with your loved one. And then finally, step six is plan for the future. And, you know, we talk about all the different things that you need to do, including medical legal issues, uh, financial issues. You want to protect your loved ones from scams and con, art con artists, you know, telemarketers, all sorts of things like that. Uh, we talk about, you know, how do you know when it's time to make a transition or to have more help in the home? How do you make that uh, transition? Um, and issues that are sometimes difficult for people to think about, like the funeral ceremony, the death itself. What does it mean to be dying from dementia? Do you want to be there at the end? What do you do with the body? You know, we talk about all these things. And finally, how do you plan for your future? So you've now heard about both the seven steps to managing your memory and the six steps to managing Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And I think you've learned a lot about how memory works, how it can break down in different brain diseases such as Alzheimer's, and what are the pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic ways of managing these types of problems. If you're interested in more information, 
Um, of course, you can take a look in my books. I also have a book that is written for healthcare professionals of any uh, profession uh, called Memory Loss, Alzheimer's Disease and Dementia, A Practical Guide for Clinicians. And I have a couple blogs, a Psychology Today blog and a Harvard Health blog. Uh, you can also uh, check out my website. And uh, I have my regular email address. You're welcome to email me if you have questions uh, after uh, the program. So thank you so much. And I'm happy to answer uh, questions. And I believe that, that Catherine is going to uh, curate some of the, the questions. Yes, um, thank you very much, Dr. Budson. And uh, there have been a number of questions about um, whether you would be willing to share your slides. Um, and I know that, um, the, uh, that the recording will be shared and people will be able to uh, see the slides in the recording. Um, yeah, I, I, I am very happy to turn my slides into a PDF. And if that is okay, if that works for people, I'll, I'll do that and, and I can send it to the organizers and they can distribute it out. So that's fine. I don't, I don't share the actual slides. I don't want you like giving my talk, uh, but I, I, I'm happy to share a PDF of the slides. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that, there were a number of questions there. Um, uh, there's a good question that I know is covered in the book, uh, but that uh, you didn't talk about today. And that is, uh, when do you know that it's uh, time to maybe take someone to the doctor? Uh, what kind of professional would you take them to if they're having memory issues? And what kind of testing uh, could be done? Yeah, absolutely. So I hope that actually just from this talk this evening that you uh, have a good sense that of what the normal changes are in memory, right? Things may need to be repeated, <clears throat> may take a little bit more time to retrieve information, <clears throat> and you may need a hint or a cue to pull out the information that you need. Um, if those problems are not the only ones and people also can't remember information, even when it's repeated, you wait a bit of time and you give a cue, well, that could be that rapid forgetting. And that's when I say, okay, it's time to go to the doctors. Now, this may be more mild than the sort of the, the common sense view, but it's very important to go to the doctor early because number one, there's more you can do to prevent the, uh, the worsening the earlier you go. And as I described, the medication works better when the, the problem is more mild, there's more brain cells still living. So it's really important to go to the doctor early. If you're not sure, it's worth going to the doctor. So what doctor do you go to? I always recommend you start with the primary care doctor, but we do write into the book sort of very specifically like, what should the doctor be doing? And the doctor should take a proper history from both uh, you, if you're the one worried about your memory, but also from a family member or, or a close friend, because if you're the one who's having memory problems, it's hard to remember all the times you forget things, right? So it's always good to have the doctor speak with both you and someone close to you. The doctor should do at least a, a brief 10 minute pencil and paper uh, test. And I will tell you that what's often called the mini cog, drawing a clock and three words, that is not enough, okay? That is not enough. It should be like uh, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment or the Mini Mental State Examination or something that takes about 10, 15 minutes, okay? So they need to do an interview with you and someone close to you. They need to do pencil and paper testing. They need to do a scan of your brain, can be a CAT scan or an MRI scan. And they need to do blood work to make sure you don't have an infection, 
to make sure your kidney function and your electrolytes and your liver function are all working uh, normally and your blood sugars are normal. And we also want you to be checked for a thyroid disorder, vitamin D and um, vitamin B12. Those are the things. And if your primary care doctor doesn't do all those things, I want you to say, you know, doc, it says in Budson's book, you're supposed to do all those things, please do them. And if they still don't do them, that's when you say, all right, we're gonna go see a specialist. And the specialists you can see, they may be different depending upon the area that you live in. So they could be a neurologist who's done advanced training in memory loss and dementia like me. They may be a neuropsychiatrist. They may be a geriatric psychiatrist. They may be a geriatrician or they may be a neuropsychologist. So there's a lot of different, uh, more than one profession, several different specialties, many different subspecialties. The key is you don't want to see a general neurologist or a general psychiatrist. You really want to see somebody who specializes in memory disorders. And that's who you want to see. And luckily, in this day and age, it's a little bit easier to be seen from afar. Right, so you may not have one within an hour of driving, uh, especially some of the you know people uh, uh, where you are uh, in, in the country. But uh, hopefully, uh, you can do a a, a tele uh, a telemedicine visit uh, with a specialist who's really trained in these things. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, there's um, a question here about the relationship between Parkinson's and dementia. Yeah. So the first thing to say is approximately half of individuals with Parkinson's disease never develop dementia. They may have a little bit of trouble with some types of cognitive issues, but like I said, half of them like never develop dementia. Now the other half do. And some people, the Parkinson's comes first and they may have it for a number of years, and then they begin to develop uh, dementia. Uh, some of these people have what we call uh, the symptoms of dementia with Lewy bodies, where in addition to the Parkinson's symptoms, they can have visual hallucinations that are usually of uh, children or small people or animals. They can have uh, uh, an interesting uh, uh, disorder where they act out their dreams while they are sleeping, okay? And sometimes this dementia with Lewy bodies actually starts first, so they can actually get the dementia first, and then the Parkinson's symptoms can come uh, later. And the last thing I'll say is because life is complicated and Alzheimer's is common, more than half of people that have Parkinson's disease dementia or dementia with Lewy bodies when the dementia starts first, more than half of them also have Alzheimer's disease at the same time. So it's very common to get the two diseases together. Okay, thank you. Um, there are a number of questions, um, follow-up questions having to do with diet. Uh, and uh, one of them has to do with um, substituting uh, something like stevia uh, instead of sugar, uh, but also there's a question about uh, the natural sugars that occur in fruit and whether that's something um, you need to worry about. Yeah, so I will tell you that like I'm someone like, I used to love diet sodas, like would drink a ton of them. And then the studies started to come out. The first study showed, oh, you don't actually lose weight if you drink diet sodas. And people are like scratching their head, like, why is that? And then the study started to come out looking at uh, diet sodas and sugar sodas and Alzheimer's. And it didn't seem to really make a difference. They were both bad for you and both more likely to 
to have you develop Alzheimer's. And what we now realize is that the sugar substitutes, they're like too good a substitute. They're so good that they trick our pancreas into releasing insulin. And you get a large spike of insulin mm -hmm. that does a couple bad things. So one thing is that large spikes of insulin are not good for the brain, okay? Uh, it, it ends up pushing uh, sugars uh, into the bloodstream when that's not where we want the sugars to be. So we can actually starve the brain. So these big spikes of insulin are bad. And unfortunately, the artificial sweeteners often cause that spike of insulin. The second uh, reason that the uh, artificial sweeteners are bad is the spike of insulin makes you hungry. So you end up, you know, I mean, if you count your calories perfectly, you can avoid this second factor. But most people, they eat the artificial sweeteners, it makes them hungry. They end up eating the same number of calories as if they would have had a, a, a natural sugar. Now, fruit, okay, um, fruit I really think is okay. Now, if you tell me like, well, aren't vegetables better? Yes, vegetables are better. I'm not gonna deny, vegetables are better. And by the way, potatoes are not a vegetable, okay? <laughs> I don't care that they grow in the ground, they're not a vegetable, all right? They're a starch, okay? Grains are grains. Potatoes are potatoes, okay? Uh, they're not vegetables, neither of those, okay? So um, the good thing about fruit is, let's say you eat an apple. And yes, it's got a lot of fructose in it and, and other sugars. But if you eat you know, a regular apple, not a baked apple, not applesauce, a regular apple, your stomach has to do a lot of work to release those sugars. And the sugars come out relatively slowly. They don't come out in this huge spike. And it's a much more natural thing. We actually evolved eating fruit. Fruit is like built into us. Some people really call um, uh, hominids uh, fruitarians because that's actually what we evolved uh, eating more than anything else. So I really think if you have fruits and vegetables fish, other seafoods, poultry, and you're not like frying things, you are, you're going to be healthy. You know, all the things on that Mediterranean menu and fruit, I really think are, are fine. You're not going to hurt yourself eating fruit. Hey, thank you. Um, there's uh, a question here uh, and um, an individual indicated that her father um, who uh, is taking lithium as a supplement. Um, is there any benefit from that? So he's taking lithium, not for bipolar disease, but because he read an article that it can be beneficial to prevent Alzheimer's. Yeah, so lithium is one of many currently prescribed medications that is actively being researched to see if it could be beneficial at either treating or preventing Alzheimer's disease. So I feel very uh, 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 confident in saying that we do not know yet whether lithium is helpful or not, but lithium can cause all sorts of problems, including permanent kidney damage. So my strong recommendation would be to wait on the lithium if it's only, he's only taking it for, um, uh, uh, to try and prevent Alzheimer's, I would wait to see the results of the clinical trials or, or sort of go into a study where he's taking it will contribute to you know, the knowledge that we need. You know, I, I just don't recommend it uh, right now, because there's just too many side effects, some of which are permanent. So that would be my recommendation. But it could end up being great, it, but it's just not proven yet. Okay, thank you. Um, 
there's um, another question here um, having to do with um, uh, marijuana and whether marijuana is something that um, might um, be helpful. Yes, absolutely. So I have actually for another book I'm writing that's coming out in 2023, um, so you have to have me back. So um, this, uh, so I researched all the literature, read all of it, really up until like you know last month. And the 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 first thing to say is that um, uh, as I think probably most people on this uh, uh, Zoom uh, call know, cannabis, marijuana has a lot of different substances in it. Uh, one of the major substances is THC, uh, tetrahydrocannabinol. Uh, and THC is the molecule that generally produces the sort of high intoxicated uh, feeling. And that seems to clearly impair um, uh, thinking and memory. I, I think there, there's no question uh, that it does. Now, the good thing is, that in carefully done uh, studies where uh, people of many different ages who were chronic marijuana users who stopped using it, their memories actually returned to normal. And um, so we don't think that uh, uh, cannabis use, even if it's like daily, we don't think it permanently damages the memory but it does impair the memory when people are taking it. And we think it's from the THC. Now the CBD part, uh, the cannabidiol part, uh, we actually think that may be protective against some of the uh, memory harming effects of THC. Now, um, when I went to college, which was a very long time ago, the ratio of THC to CBD, it was approximately, you know, 10 times this, uh, the, uh, the THC to the, to the CBD. But now this ratio has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger uh, because the strains have been bred to produce more THC, more of the intoxicating uh, effects. And the CBD is no longer large enough there's no longer enough of it to counteract the uh, THC, okay? And uh, studies have been done with CBD alone, and it clearly does not impair memory from the published studies. And there's even one or two studies that show that CBD could actually help a little bit in terms of of memory. So I'm not recommending, I am not recommending, I'm saying this again, I am not recommending that everybody go out and get CBD to help their memory. But I, I certainly don't think CBD from the published studies, I don't think CBD is harmful uh, to, uh, uh, to the memory. And I await more studies to see uh, whether or not, you know, maybe certain types of CBD uh, could end up being helpful. The last thing I want to say about marijuana is I uh, often have family members say, you know, will it help my dad, you know, with Alzheimer's? Can it help his anxiety, his depression, his agitation, his memory? And, you know, I always tell my family members, I give them the data, just like I've told you all. And I say, go for it. Let me know. Tell me if it helps or it doesn't help. And uh, I'm still waiting to hear a single family member say it's been helpful. So I, I, I hope it will help some people and maybe we can figure out, oh, it helps these people with these problems, but not those people with, with their problems. So far, I haven't heard any help for people with Alzheimer's, but who knows if you have help with your loved one, type it into the chat, you know, we'll, I'll get some data right here. Okay, thank you. Um... I think this will be our last question because we've only got three minutes left, but I think it's an important one. And the person who put it in provided some specific information and it has to do with heredity and development of dementia and Alzheimer's. 
And the individual who put the question in um, had two paternal aunts who had um, dementia and a father who had Alzheimer's. And the question is, um, how does uh, heredity um, affect um, the potential for developing Alzheimer's? Yes, no, that all, I will answer those. And I will just let you know, Catherine, that uh, Andy typed into the chat that we can keep talking if, if you would like, and it's, it's fine with me. So I don't mind going a little bit over if, if people want to continue to listen to us uh, 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 answer questions. I'm, I'm happy to answer more questions. So I'm going to answer the hereditary question because that is very important. But I did see someone wrote in the chat, if fruit is good, what about fruit juices? And the answer is fruit juices are not good. And the reason that fruit juices are not good is because the, 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 instead of your stomach needing to work to break down all of the cellulose and the way all the sugars are packaged, all that breaking down is done ahead of time. And so you drink the juice and it's like straight sugar into your bloodstream and you get that big spike of insulin. So believe it or not, there's a big difference between fruit and fruit juices. And this is why I said, like, if you're gonna eat an apple, right? Not apple juice, not apple sauce, not even a baked apple, just a straight apple. That's what's healthy. Once you turn it into juice, it's not healthy. Sorry about that. Okay, heredity. So the studies show that, uh, so first of all, this individual with a father with Alzheimer's and two aunts, presumably fathers, sisters, with dementia. You now know that dementia is not a disease in itself. It's just a category, right? It's just a category. And that those aunts probably had Alzheimer's too. So really it's several people in the family in one generation with Alzheimer's. And if you have a family history of Alzheimer's, it does raise your own risk twofold to fourfold. So to put some numbers on that, the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease at age 65 without a family history is about 3%. So with a family history that's doubled to quadruple, so that's 6% to 12%. But that still means you have an 88% chance of not developing uh, Alzheimer's disease. And the last thing I wanna say about hereditary is if you look at everyone with Alzheimer's, Half the people have a family history, but the other half do not. So unfortunately, we are all at risk of developing uh, Alzheimer's disease, even if you don't have a family history. So you still need to eat the right things, exercise, et cetera. Hey, uh, thank you. And I think there's another question here related that's similar, um, and that is, that uh, people have been reading that there is an apparent uh, increase in dementia and an increase in the number of people who have Alzheimer's. Um, it, is this just normal because we're living longer uh, or are there other factors um, that um, might be contributing to um, all the discussion about the Alzheimer's and dementia? Yeah, so the good news is it really, it, this ha the, that's a really good question and it has been studied. And the answer is it does seem to be just because we are living longer and otherwise healthier lives. I mean, people used to die of heart disease and strokes very frequently. And now with the good treatments and better understanding of proper diets, that's much more rare. People used to die of cancers. And people still die of cancer, but boy, we are doing so much better at helping people to cure their cancers or live with their cancers a very long time. And um, if, yeah, and, and so, so really that's, that's the main reason why. There's one other reason why there might be a little bit more. Uh, people who maybe were born around 1900 Believe it or not, they probably ate a diet that had less sugar, less processed food, 
they were less obese, right, than people who were born, you know, in like the 1940s, 1950s. So, so uh, some of it, uh, most of it is because we're living longer, but some of it is because um, of, you know, just people got fat and didn't always eat the right thing. And, you know, our, our government scientists didn't always say the right thing in terms of what were the healthy foods. You know, I think, you know, when I grew up, you were supposed to have like 10, 10 you know, bowls of cereal or other grains a day. You know, now we say, you know, whole grains are fine, but in moderation, not as much as, you know, I was told, you know, in sixth grade. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, and that uh, segues us back to another question about diet. Uh, and um, there are questions here about the benefits or pros and cons of vegan or vegetarian diet uh, with regard to uh, brain health. Yeah, so um, uh, vegan and vegetarian diets are good because they help avoid some of the harmful things such as people who eat a lot of red meat and stuff like that. So that's good for sure. The hard thing about vegan diets is you have to make sure you get enough protein, okay, for sure. And you have to make sure you have enough B12. And so it's really important to make sure that your B12 levels are normal if you are a vegetarian, particularly if you're a vegan. And I strongly recommend you get your blood levels of B12 checked if you are a vegetarian. And you really want the levels at least 400. The normal range may say like 220 is the lower limit of normal, but for brain problems, it needs to be above 400. So it would be good to get that checked. But is it healthier? to be vegan or vegetarian than to eat the Mediterranean menu of foods that I mentioned? No, no, there really isn't evidence for that. Fish have a lot of good things in them. They have omega-3 fatty acids that are very good uh, for the brain. Uh, they're a great source of protein. It is important to watch fish that contains mercury. And uh, my, my recommendations are to, uh, to look at uh, uh, the websites uh, from the FDA. If you Google uh, fish that are good to eat FDA, it, it, will, it will come up and it'll let you know which have high mercury. Stay away from the ones that have high mercury. But other than that, fish are, are, are a really good source of protein. Okay. Um, so uh, Dr. Budson, um, I wanna thank you very much for a very informative uh, presentation. Um, Andy put the link uh, to where you can uh, find uh, Dr. Budson's books. Uh, but if you just search Andrew Budson uh, books, it'll give you all the books in order. Uh, and um, you can order those. And we will look forward to being back in touch uh, a year from now uh, when your new book comes out. Uh, and um, for people, um, who are members of Ali or who are interested in joining Ali uh, during our winter session and the registration open today, we are having a special class on the newest science associated with aging. And we have um, scientists from uh, the Buck Institute, from Harvard, uh, from Vanderbilt, I believe, or Emory, but it's, a, it's an outstanding uh, class that will give you a lot of the newest uh, research, uh, not just having to do with memory, but with other aspects of uh, aging and uh, recommendations for living not just a longer lifespan, but a healthier lifespan. So uh, again, thank you very much for being with us this evening. Um, Thank you, Dr. Budson, and uh, thank you also to AHEC uh, for uh, co-sponsoring this event. Um, when we work together, we do better. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening.